You are listening to the Julie Parker Practice Success Podcast, where you discover management insights and strategies for a successful dental practice. There are also interviews with key people in the industry who have advice and services to help you and your team achieve great success. So I'm enormously excited at the opportunity that's in front of me right now for the Julie Parker Practice Success Podcast, and that is to interview Dr. Michael Cernick. He's been such a guru for dental practices and dentists over the past decades, and I'm thrilled to welcome you onto this coming episode. Thank you, Michael. Well, thank you very much, Julie. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. For those few people out there that don't actually know who you are, and I'm sure it is only a minority of people because certainly through my career, your your presence was very strong. Can you tell us just a little bit about your origins? Well, um, I've been a dentist for a long time. I graduated 1971, I think it was. And um, I went to the UK and I worked there for six years, um, it was different times then, and we were allowed to do anaesthetics in terms of general anaesthetics, and that's what I did. So I was doing a lot of GAs, nasal intubations, even on three-year-olds and stuff like that. Um, so it was very different times, but it, it did give me an awful lot of uh, experience in dentistry of all types types of dentistry. Um, so by the time I came, and I'd owned my own practice there, so by the time I came back to Australia, um, even though I'd only been practicing for like six years, I felt like I had a tremendous amount of uh, experience, just clinical experience, having done all sorts of things. And I'd, I'd operated with a hygienist there. In fact, I had several hygienists in the UK, and that was very much what I was used to. When I came back to Australia, hygienists were just starting to become something. And I very quickly got two hygienists. I imported them, one from America, one from South Africa. It it was very clear to me that it was so important to have hygienists working for me because it meant like if I didn't have a hygienist, it was as if I was willfully lowering my hourly rate by having to do hygiene work, which was just plainly stupid in my mind. I couldn't understand it. So having hygienists to do that work and which enabled me to do whatever I wanted to do clinically it was made dentistry much more interesting and exciting. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that was important at that time for me, um, my I guess development, was that we weren't allowed to advertise at all and because there was no advertising, um, I had to find other ways to grow and I realised fairly quickly that the only way to grow was to get patients to tell their friends about me So I started to do things in such a way that I gave the patients talking points, something that they could pass on to their friends. Because if if nothing new happened, why would they even talk about you? And so I was, that made me a bit more adventurous than the average dentist. I did all sorts of things to try to increase not just the efficiency of dentistry, which most people just sort of work on, like within your own little world, but to try to think in terms of what can I be doing that gets the patients to talk about me. And that worked very well. So I grew and I ended up with five different practices over the years and at a time when very few dentists had more than one practice. It wasn't. Now it's normal, but then it absolutely was not. You, you had one practice for life and that was the way it was then because, because it was very hard to start new practices really. Um, so um, so that, that was another thing. And, and then in my mid forties, um, I decided, look, at that stage, dentistry had just got to the point where it was maximising everything and technology really hadn't kicked in yet. So even though I was very early in getting a computer for dentistry and a laser and stuff like that, um, it sort of got to the point that after 23 years of clinical practice, I felt like I'd done it all and I wanted to do something else, anything, quite frankly. I just felt like a change. I wasn't unhappy with dentistry. It's just like I felt like I was repeating the same sort of stuff all the time. <clears throat> By the way, today, dentistry is so dynamic. There's so many new things happening. I'm sure I wouldn't have um, had that view, but that's how it was back then for me. So I quit and I did all sorts of things. I was a corporate trainer. I did lots of stuff. I, was, I lived overseas for many years. Um, I lived in Lake Tahoe, skied every day. You know, it was just a great sort of midlife retirement, really. Um, But anyway, I came back to Australia. My parents were here and I joined with uh, another dentist uh, for prime practice and and we were partners in that. And I did that for 13 years. So that's when I started to create 
a course called Prime Speak, um, and that became quite a big thing for that company. Uh, did that for 13 years. Uh, it took me internationally because I was in Las Vegas several times a year uh, at large dental. Well, we, we ran Prime Speak around the world in the UK and, and Asia and all over the place. Now, what was different about that particular course was that it wasn't a sales course. And I sort of realized that trying to talk patients into saying yes that whole process of trying to convince them to do essentially expensive dentistry, I just couldn't do it. I felt really uncomfortable with it. Patients didn't like it. I'd been to a few courses and everything I tried didn't seem to work. It sounded good in theory, but when you tried to essentially talk somebody into stuff, you ended up with people that didn't like you very much, some of them. I mean, some of them did it, of course, but a lot of them won't. And because I was so sensitive to trying to grow the practice through human interaction, I, I was quite sensitive to the fact that some people, even one out of 10, feeling like this dentist is trying to talk me into stuff, turned me right off that approach. And almost by accident, I discovered that when I was talking to people and I'd say something like, look, you don't, you don't have to do this. Don't do this just because I would do this myself. Really, you should just do whatever you want. So I was really like stepping back a lot. And that whole process I noticed over the years that just through trial and error that people were doing it more when I reversed instead of when I was advancing all the time. And so that just set off my mind into a different approach that became this course, and it was counterintuitive. Most people think it, without having done it, it would have been a sales course because usually the term dental communications is essentially a euphemism for, for sales training. Um, but this really wasn't. It was exactly the opposite of sales training. You're trying to get the patient to say, no, I actually want to have my implant or no, I want to have a bridge. And the reason they're saying no was because the words that just preceded that were me saying something like, don't do this. You know, you don't only do it if you want to, et cetera. So that, that whole process turned into a very large program. And it was more than just those words. It was, there was a whole process to it whereby most communications when you talk about it it's getting the patient at the last moment to select this or that whereas what was happening here we were setting the patient up very early in the appointment to essentially want this type of treatment so it wasn't the the clothes that made all the difference if, if you were looking at sales terms it wasn't those last few words just before a decision made the decision was made almost right at the beginning and you said and you sort of morphed and shaped the patient's views all the way through. And by the time they got there, it was a done deal. And so a lot of it was just building trust and rapport and just having the patient really like you. And all of those, you know, psychological components were really important. And because you can't script this out, you sort of have to start with some sort of principles because scripting doesn't work. Because, you know, if you're using a script in two seconds, the patient will say something that's not in the book and you don't know what to say. So, you know, you have to start with a deeper principle, which is really what this, this was all about. So that, that became, I, I guess, the defining sort of credo for me to work with. It was something that other people hadn't done. I still haven't seen anything like that over the years and uh, it, it really was very successful so that, that was the basis of my my background <laughs> trying to put it into a nutshell a very large nut <laughs> <laughs> well after many years in the industry starting from 71 it is a large nutshell that's for sure just going back quickly when you owned five practices did you own them all at the same time or were they subsequent ownerships it was a mixture of both uh, at one point i had a practice in north sydney at the same time, I had a practice in, I think it was Elizabeth Street or Pitt Street, I can't remember, in the city. Uh, then I had a practice in um, the Macquarie Centre. And I had a, uh, and so yeah, th there were times when I had two, but even then it was actually hard to run multiple practices. And it all happened because I was doing a lot of Crown and Bridge work and I was getting referrals. And then a practice came up for sale and he was doing Crown and Bridge. And I thought that'd be a good idea. So anyway, in those days, I think it was a mistake to try to grow too much because it was sort of complex trying to do all that. And only a dentist could own a practice in those days. So the market was very different than it is today. Without the advertising and without, anyway, 
Today, it's different. If you wanted to grow, grow multiple practices, it's definitely possible. But the mistake people make is they do it too quickly without having embedded down really good systems in one practice. Uh, a young dentist will buy a practice and think it's great, it's working, I'll buy another one, and then the next one isn't working as, as, as well. And as they keep growing practices, there's sort of diminishing returns. Um, unless you really know what you're doing and have a great system so that it's totally duplicatable without the dentist being around, that's the key. And that's what you're talking about with this as well. When obviously the development of trust and rapport at the start of that relationship with a patient that's moving through an appointment time, without that stuff, it the other side of it where you're actually suggesting treatments that they would like to jump on board with, that becomes a challenge. And how do you duplicate yes. all of that emotional intelligence stuff of this is how you build a strong, trusting, rapport-based relationship with a patient very quickly we don't have you know years to develop these sort of relationships that like we do with our normal relationships outside of working environments but we want to get to that trusting rapport built relationship very swiftly with patients and that's the difficult part of how to train people because as you say you can't script that out the minute they say one thing that's not, not on your script you're off script and you're just left up to your own devices so i do yeah it's such an interesting space your career and how it's how it has morphed into what it is now because the prime speak is certainly the dominant thing that I knew you for I never actually took any prime speak courses or anything but as a dental consultant going into dental practices so many of them say oh we learned that at prime speak we learned this at prime speak so it has a, a overwhelming impact in people's careers and as a dentist you've got you know you start off your career and you the first thing you want to do is develop your physical skills, I'm sure. But with the communication skills that you learned over your years, I'm, I would imagine that you would be suggesting young dentists now, focus on that now, just like you do your clinical skills. Well, very clearly, um, that's the thing about dentistry. You graduate, you have some clinical skills. You don't even know you don't know when it comes to the rest of it. You know, you're so ignorant. Um, and I don't mean that in a nasty way. It's just like you just don't know that you don't know. You don't know that a huge component of your success is going to come from your ability to form relationships and how to communicate. And that typically just takes years and years of development. A lot of dentists, even their 50s and 60s, still have never quite got it. They're still, they get into a bit of a loop and they, you know, nothing changes. Um, it's actually quite hard. There's no real courses out there except that at the time um, that that gave people even an insight into it. The only courses that typically people went to were essentially consultants who had no dental experience, but they had sales experience and corporate sales experience typically. And they'll essentially use cliched sales techniques that every person who's in any company has heard of. And dentists don't even know that sales training is the number one form of 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 training in the world. There's nothing bigger than sales training. Every company, every bank, every shop has sales training. And so when your client, your patient in the chair has been trained in sales and you, the young dentist, pick up on some very basic sales technique like a choice close or something, and and you know, and you're using that thinking, aren't I smart? I'm using a sales technique. The person looking at you, lying in the chair, looking up at you, thinking, you're an idiot. You're using a sales technique that's very basic. I can see right through what you're doing. I don't like you anymore now because I don't like my healthcare professional trying to sell me anything. I don't want to go to a doctor and be told, you know, would you like, you know, the kidney out? Or do you, I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I, I don't want that at all. It shouldn't be about sales. And so that whole process is like wrong from beginning to end. And the problem is the sales consultant has no concept of these sensitivities in dentistry. You can't just go selling patient stuff. They hate it. And the dentist isn't even good at it. So the whole thing just falls apart. It does. I agree with you. And I think even if they see value in the service you've provided, they just won't get it with you. They might get it with somebody else because That's you've right. broken down that element of trust. Because the moment you've got bring Absolutely. your agenda to the table and leave their patient's agenda to the side is when you do start losing that trust. And that reminds me too of the book by Marcus Sheridan, They Ask, You Answer. And in that, the first few pages it said, no longer is other salespeople 
the most important pe- person in the buying process for people. Now they can jump online on your website, on your Facebook page, look at all your posts and get a feel for what they want. So by the time the salesperson's needed, they're at 85% about to buy into your product anyway. And you were mentioning about the ability to communicate effectively and build that rapport and trust at the very start. So we need to put, take the hook out of the sales process and put the hook into the so-called marketing process or that rapport building process. Well, there's two things there that that's 100% correct. But on top of that being correct is the, the, the effect of the team. When, when we created, well, when I created PrimeSpeak, it was all based on my 1990-something, last century's um, training and, and thinking, and that didn't involve the team at all. In fact, PrimeSpeak, we, we actually didn't allow team members to do it. It was only for dentists because it seemed to be too, I guess, quite frankly, uh, complex or irrelevant to the team. And there was a lot of sort of psychological to and froing, and there was no role for the team because in those days, the team member basically used the sucker. That was about it and retracted. They, they, they didn't hardly communicate. Okay, answering the phone, but that's about it. Whereas today, that's entirely turned around and a really well-developed practice uses the dentist to do the minimum amount of talking, actually. The dentist should go in there, do an exam, get the hell out of there. The team members should be handling everything, just like if you go to a really well-organized medical practitioner. It's, it's, not, the dent- it's not the doctor that gives you the, the injections or the bandages or any of that type of stuff or even the workup. I mean, you know, taking the blood pressure and all that stuff, that's done by other people. The, the doctor should be doing just the, the absolute minimum stuff that is only a doc, doctor can do. And all the rest of the relationship building, ideally, from, the, from an effectiveness point of view, should be done by team members because they can do it. And I learned this very well when I saw it in America because in those days I'd go to the States a lot and we didn't allow the team members to come in. The dentist was saying, you're nuts. I don't do this talking. The team member does it. So we started putting the team members. We saw all the difference. And you can imagine that how much time is wasted if the dentist is doing everything. I mean, there are still dentists in this country that answer the phone. I was at a dentist recently. He answered the phone every time it rang. How idiotic is that? It's mm. so inefficient. But that was how it was in the 19-whatever hundreds, and that, doesn't, that shouldn't be happening now at all. So there is a paradigm shift uh, regarding uh, the, the level of training that you should be doing with your team members uh, on communications is very different than it used to be, and that wasn't in prime speak at all. No, that's interesting. And I think a lot of dentists out there may be thinking, gosh, if I asked my team to come on board and do these communications training and things, you some team members will embrace it. They've got that space where they want to consistently get better in what they do and become more and more competent and skilled in what they do and they get excited by that learning journey. Others aren't as excited by that learning journey and indeed it could alienate some team members where they think I'm that he's asking me to sell now I'm not happy with it the feeling of this well, right. has changed and so that's more about making sure you've got the right people on the bus isn't it and the way your Absolutely. hiring process is hiring for this team of magnificent communicators well there's two things if you you can't hire the right people to do sales uh, easily in dentistry for them to chase patients around and try to talk them into stuff and ring them afterwards when the patient says I'll think about it it's very tacky and very uncomfortable, and really nobody enjoys that. So, yes, you need the right people, but more importantly, you need to have a right model in your head as to what should the team members should, what's their, what, what should they be doing? How should they, should they be selling it? And if, if they haven't done this sort of counterintuitive training, they won't know what to do. They'll think that what they're supposed to be doing is selling, and they'll resent the dentist for it because I'm now trying to sell stuff to a patient, and they don't necessarily believe that the treatment's even the right treatment, but just is the most expensive treatment. So you've got all this undercurrent of, of, of sort of resentment going on. He's forcing you to sell. I don't want to sell. I feel like I'm taking advantage of patients. Uh, it's really uncomfortable. The patients hate it. Nothing's working here. And so, of course, that whole thing collapses, even if you've got the right person in. So there's more elements in it that have to be put in place, I think. Yeah. And they all just start, start to sabotage the efforts of the practice which is generally and usually quite authentic in that they would like to deliver their patients the best possible treatment for them to help create 
the best outcomes for them with as positive an experience as possible for them. And one of the things I hear as a consultant is I haven't got you on board yet because I wanted to get the right team members first before I spent money on the training. But I think what I do tend to suggest to dentists out there is have a very clear picture of the experience you want to deliver your patients right now and just hire those sort of people, whether you've got the training in place now or not. What you want to do is get the people on board within your practice who are going to, one, be excited about developing skills because we can't just deliver a particular script or a particular style and never want to exceed on that and build on that. We want to have people that recognise and are excited by seeing opportunities for growth and progression and get better and better and better. And you just identifying that practice that you want to eventually get, that may help start to weed out the people that aren't going to be excited about that purpose, that agenda, that journey. So you can then create the space to get these magnificent people on board and do the kind of training that's going to make a true difference. I agree, of course. Uh, But it is a chicken and an egg. I mean, in the ideal world, you'd have the perfect training. First of all, the dentist would need a perfect model. Then they have to have um, the right people, critical, and they need to have the right training so that it all fits together. Um, and if you have the wrong people with the best training, you'll have problems. The, the opposite, which is basically not having the training, having great people, and it's still going to be a problem. So mm. it all needs to come together. For sure. So where has the evolution taken you to date? What's been taking up your time the last number of years since prime practice? Well, what I realised that people would come to my courses multiple times And at first I used to be flattered with that. Isn't that nice? They're coming again and again and again. Seems terrific. And then I realised, hang on, (laughs) something's wrong here. They're coming again and again because they're not remembering it and they're struggling. And it's all very well. And I guess I've got to an age in my life where if I've done all this work and I've created these concepts and whatever and people aren't remembering it, I feel like I've failed and I didn't want that. So sitting on my farm here thinking about it and I, I'd just been in the States for a year I came back just when COVID hit on the last plane out of Dallas <laughs> and um, and so I've spent over a year working out an online program that solves all the issues that we've just mentioned and that's been a considerable effort so that's mean I'm doing nothing else but creating a, a system and it's both the system and the content for to achieve the results that we're talking about. So you could take any practice, frankly, with any team member and have it so that they learn everything and they, most importantly, remember everything and learn how to apply it so that it works and then it can work at scale. And if you've got that figured out, then everything sort of falls into place after that. that that's been my agenda. Oh, that is fantastic. And so is there a specific niche of practices that you are that you are aiming to work with or who would benefit from this? Uh, I think any practice. The ones that possibly benefit the most are the larger ones because that's, you know, if you've just got two people working for you, you can sort of work with those two people and manage things and, okay, it'll take time, but you'll get there. Uh, on the other hand, if you've got 25 people there, you need a system because information doesn't translate uh, effectively if, if, if it's too big. And if you've got multiple practices, good luck with that in order to get the highest level of functionality where the team members can manage the patient and talk to the patient and do all the things that need to be done. That's extremely difficult. I mean, in good times, everything works. And that's the thing that some big corporates are starting to realise now because I was at a dental show recently and there was um, essentially no corporates there. And the reason for that is they've all stopped trying to buy more practices because they're all in financial trouble because when when the days were fine, it's like being in real estate. The market's going up, you feel like you're a genius because you bought something and, hey, I doubled my money, great. The market's going down, you need some skills to how to make money in a, in a crappy market. And that's, what's, that's what can happen when things 
turn. And right now we haven't seen everything turn because if interest rates start going up and people start suffering, you might think today's tough with COVID or whatever, but it's going to be tougher when the whole market sort of turns around and if negative gearing comes into Australia and as, as a, removing it and suddenly every investor now is facing losses all the time, dentistry gets affected in, with, with bad times and I've seen it happen over the years. And when days are rosy, everything's fine. But you need really good skills and systems to survive and to grow in tough markets. That hasn't happened yet, I don't think. And it is getting, and it bring, like, bring it back down to make sure that these foundations that help support growth and maintaining a certain viability, that they're in place in such a way that, as you say, it's it's less it's less reliant on that one practitioner making sure they're the driving force behind things. And so this is Cernic Speak? Correct. And I, how I gave that it a out? name that had some alliteration because it's memorable, <laughs> but also, uh, you know, I, I created Prime Speak and a lot of people had no, in fact, some people thought that other people created it and it annoyed me a little bit. I guess my ego got in the way, but it, so I thought I'd, I'd stick stick my name in this thing. <laughs> And it certainly makes it sticky because it's already sticky in many people's brain part of it anyway. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think it's very well named. <laughs> and so if practices were intrigued about what Cernic Speak is and how they could try to implement it within their practice, tell us more around that. Okay, so th- this is such a long discussion. I'm going to really try to not elaborate too much because uh, there's many moving parts to this. But the, the quick summary, I guess, is consider, let's say there's 90 videos, but they're very short. They're five minutes long, approximately. Some are longer, some are shorter, but most, of, let's say it's that. If you were to um, have it so that team members, first of all, how should I start? Let's imagine the whole team sits together and they watch a video in a training room, any video, five minute video. That's fine. Um, We know that people will forget quite a lot of content and the studies show that after 30 days, having watched pretty well anything, especially soft skills, 95% literally is forgotten. 30 days later, they can't remember. And and the way to make people remember it is to repeat it, but not the video, but but to repeat certain little testing because you can't have people do what they did with training courses, which is go to a course forget half, go back again, go back again, go back. You can't do that because it costs money to stop the practice um, It's and it costs money to attend the course and you've constantly got all these people coming backwards and forwards doing the same course again and again and again and half the room now will know the content and be bored. The other half are still confused and they don't know. And so that whole system of just forcing people to train and retrain is part of the problem for a start. Okay, so that's the problem. The solution was, okay, let's say the videos are available online, which is nothing new, Um, but now let's say that the whole team watches the first video together. They don't need to because it could be done individually. So we all watch it together, okay. The system knows which team members were there. Basically, every person has to log in. So the system is customised to each individual. That's a very important concept because if you have a large practice, let's say there's 20 people there, um, six months later, there are probably going to be some different people there. So you can't just assume that everybody's going through the same process. So you have to individualise it for a start. Okay. Now, let's say we watch a, we watch the video. Um, the system knows they watched it. Two days later every team member gets a little text on their own phone with a little questionnaire. It's a very short questionnaire. It's done in such a way that I won't describe it too much but because it, it gets into too much detail. But fun, it's a very – it takes about 10 seconds to answer. But what it does is it refreshes their memory on the key points. Okay, so they look at it. They'll put in the answer. Um if they don't know the answer, whether they know it or not, the, the correct answer pops up anyway. So it's not just a testing process, it's a refreshing process, which is very important. So that happens two days later. Um, Another week later, the process is repeated again. 
they get it again on their text, each individual. They can set it up as to get when they want to get the text, but the point is the texts only take literally 10 seconds to fill out, very, very quick on a, on a text thing. Um, the system is is recording all this. It knows who's getting it right and who's getting it wrong. So, therefore, you get your first text immediately afterwards, and when you answer that, it's all still in your working memory, so you'll probably get it right. That gives you the confidence to know that the test is valid because you already got it right. Two days later, you do it again. Maybe you'll have forgotten something, but you won't blame the test saying this is a stupid test because you got it right last time. So you, you do it again. Five Seven days later, you do it again. And then 30 days later, you do it again. If on the 30th day you've, you've got it right, the system knows you know it. If you didn't get it right, the process repeats. But you don't have to keep watching the video again. That's the whole point. You can watch the video any time because that's accessible to you. But it's not forcing people to go through this boring learning process of learning and relearning. All we're doing now is making sure they can remember the key points because that's all that matters anyway. The rest of it is fluff. And so it's very efficient. And now imagine if there's like 90 different videos on all these different topics um, so that you can work with a big team and the manager, whoever is the manager, gets a report that they can access any time to see which team members have done what and what's their level of, of learning. So that's it in a sort of a nutshell again. <laughs> and, um, and now we've got a system that is individualized. It's very quick and efficient. And it actually creates a, a passive learning process. Normally, when you want to learn something and study for a, a course, you work hard, you study, you test yourself. It's it's an effort. This happens in an effortless way because it just pops up. You answer it. You see the answer anyway, and it's refreshing in your brain, and it's done in a sequence, but it's passively absorbed in your brain. You don't even realize you've learned it, but you've learned it. And it's very practical based. This isn't a whole bunch of theory. It's stuff that you would use every single day. So what you're now doing is being able to take the, the whole team and raise their level of understanding. Now, there's extra things that can be done with little exercises and things, but fundamentally, that gives everybody, puts them on the same page, and it's extremely efficient. That's, that's it in a sort of a nutshell again. Well, I love it. I absolutely love it. The concept behind um, tapping into, you know, in Daniel Pink's book, Drive, he identifies our three main drivers are purpose, autonomy, and mastery. And it really taps into that mastery, doesn't it? That we have an yeah. internal drive to be able to get better and better at what we do. And we love feeling competent. We can't stand feelings of incompetence, which can sometimes be the barrier towards further learning for team members. I, I feel quite comfortable with my skill set now, and this is a very comfortable space to be in. I don't want to step into a world where it's identified that possibly I could do better and I'm lacking in some way. But creating that structure around it's tapping into and giving team members a obvious path of progression. Because we forget how good we get at things, don't we? We forget we forget that we used to not know this stuff, but now we do know it. So this is identifying, look at all these areas that you've ticked off and you have progressed so far, you are achieving that sense of mastery. And that's an exciting enticement, even for new team members coming on board, if they are part of and delivering this kind of training. That's right. And, and this the technology that enables this, to work wasn't available a few years ago. And so nobody's done this. Uh, I, I've looked at lots of different training systems. Nobody's done exactly this at all. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you can't use multiple choice questions in soft skills because if I said to you some question about answering the phone, I'd said, which is the correct one? There are either going to be four ridiculous answers and one correct one or five variations of something that's all okay and under certain circumstances any of them can apply and so multiple choice is, is a very poor testing method because what it's doing is it gives you the right answer which means you're in a recognition mode and what you need to be is is not recognition you need to be able to create the concept and the recreation in other words and the system i'm using is not multiple choice uh, it's a different way of doing it, but it, it forces your brain to actually come up with the answer instead of just recognise the answer because just recognition doesn't mean you know it. Mm, you mm. understand? Yeah, absolutely. And, and multiple choice works fine when it's hard skills, like is the answer 12, 24, 36, 48, and, okay, there's a right and wrong answer. 
but multiple, but soft skills, you know, communication skills don't fit into those neat categories at all. And and it's very hard to be sort of didactic and say this is correct, this is incorrect, because in certain circumstances, lots of things can work. So anyway, again, that's another component that we've handled uh, in the testing method to to make it that it's uh, it's actually valid re- results. Wonderful. And gone, uh, the, you know, or there's, there's been a recognition that going to a course day and having the whole team come on board and learn a whole bunch of stuff, having the expectation that that bunch of stuff can be applied at the same all at once back when you get back into the practice situation, it's an unrealistic expectation to think of that being a successful path. And that's why, that's right, you kept getting people returning back to the courses again and again and again through Prime Speak because yeah. they needed that reminder. And it's how that's do we, right. uh, so the process that you've described, for a start, it's bite-sized. We're not doing everything all at once. We're doing one, we're focusing on one area at a time and helping you apply it in such a way that it then creates shift and change within yourself and is long-standing change rather than That's keep, right. yeah, keep doing this one thing over and over again. It's the it's not just the repetition that helps us learn. It's applying it, making those little adjustments after we didn't get the results that we always really wanted, that we can be embracing of that process, the learning journey, if you like. So when we don't get it right the first, second, third time, that's all groovy. We're just constantly evolving and getting better and better because we're making those little adjustments with the direction of Cenex Speak. I think it's magnificent. The other part about it um, is that the content is deeply dental, um, whereas one can do lots of courses on generic communications training, which actually doesn't always apply that well in dentistry. So this is coming... This doesn't apply to car sales or to veterinary sales or any other sort of system. This is very, very specifically microscopically dental and it's very practical and it comes from that world. And you tend not to see that with dental training on communications because, as I say, often the consultant comes from a different background. Anthony Robbins used to be a dental consultant before he did what he does. He was a dental motivating consultant. Now, you can imagine coming to an Anthony Robbins course on dentistry and you'll have that type of thing. You're fire walking, beating your chest. Look, I've done his course. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. But it's not going to help you that much in dentistry because what it's designed to do is give you the, the belief in yourself. And let me tell you, in my view, having belief in yourself and going into a dental practice and thinking that's all you need is a big mistake because you can have all the belief in your life. If you don't have the actual dental communication skills, you'll have high expectations after doing a course like this, thinking I can I can manage the world, I feel terrific. And then after a while, you realise, hang on, nothing's changing. I've got my belief that the patient still hates me. What, you know, what went wrong? Well, you needed the dental training as well, and you need both. I'm not saying you don't need belief, but just belief won't, won't cut it, that's all. It's like trying to be a brain surgeon with belief but no skills. Good luck, yeah, you know. That's for sure. I won't be going along to see <laughs> that one from a surgery, that's for sure. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> so technology really has helped the progression of practices change over time. I mean, years ago, as Charles you know, Coves talks about, there's benefits and drawbacks to everything. Back in, you know, they say the golden days of dentistry where you didn't have to advertise, you just had to open your doors up and people would start streaming in. There were benefits around that, but obviously drawbacks that you had very limited reach as well. The benefits nowadays, the internet has allowed us to have very broad reach and very regular reach with our client base and be able to develop a different type of relationship. But technology has certainly changed within your consulting coaching space as well, hasn't it, with practices? That That's exactly right. So, look, two things have happened with me. Is One, uh, we're using technology, which is a phone, texting, and vid- being able to access videos and being able to test and get results, all that This is just technology that already exists and we're applying it now to maximise the results. The other part of my world before this um, was was Channel D, which is using, again, very simple technology because it used to be that if you wanted to run videos or have street signage, 
um, you, you had to have very special equipment and the the videos had to be created by an advertising agency which cost you five thousand dollars for each video and you know the technology wasn't quite there to be fully practical and uh, I saw that and also I didn't like the content that people were running they were running in the in the waiting rooms they were running videos that were fundamentally almost explanations of how the treatment is done we do this is how we do a crown and they'll show you drilling a tooth down uh, this is how we do an implant and you'll see the scalpel cutting the gum and reflecting it back and drilling in the bone and poking in an implant in the bone in other words it was almost like uh how to do it yourself dentistry it was the videos like this is how we do it and the patient doesn't first of all that they're creeped out by watching it number one and secondly it doesn't make them want it just to know how it's done i don't want it just because i know how it's done i might watch brain surgery uh video but i don't want it just because i know how it's done so what we needed was getting the patient to want the treatment which is very different content than how the treatment is done very often the two things counter counteract each other so uh, I saw that there was a need to create videos and we can do it using a little media player that you can buy now for $50 from Amazon or from Google um, Chromecast. And, and you can have a little video, little media player, plug it into the back of the TV. It costs $50 to plug in. You access an app, which is a Channel D app. You have complete control of your library on your computer of what's playing in your TV. You can upload photos which get incorporated by editors into the video. So you can have very customized videos. Uh, we have uh, over 150 different videos and a whole range of different things, but they're all designed to get the patient to want the treatment. None of them are designed to tell the patient exactly how the treatment's done because that's not the issue. And that's what everybody else does. They're, and usually those videos have sound, which drives the patients to distraction. When they're sitting in the waiting room, you've got some voice droning away of, of a topic that I'm not interested in. In fact, I don't even want to watch it because it scares me. So we had to have a completely different, fresh approach using very low-cost technology and very convenient so that the dentist can or the team members can create their playlist minute by minute. They can change stuff. And so that was Channel D, and nobody else has done it like that, and it's all over the world now. And, and the other thing is now we're, we're uh, just about to launch um, uh, dental signage or signage, signage for the front using a completely different technology, which is laser projectors on a screen of the window so outside, you can have a window that's 20 feet high and you can fill that window with images if you want. And it's not just images, you can use video because typically it was very expensive stream, uh, screens with those little lights that cost an absolute fortune. The content wasn't great because it had to be very simple because it won't take a proper video. And basically it's just images and all those images are saying the same thing, come in here, I'm a dentist, who cares? Um, but what we're doing now is having completely different content that's different from the inside, by the way. It has to be essentially still asking the patient or telling the patient what we're doing, getting them to come in. But we can now uh, revolutionise the way um, patients can see from the outside what's going on uh, or what, not just what's going on, but w that this is a practice, what sort of things they do and essentially draw the patients in using technology that wasn't around before. We're just about to launch that now. Gosh, it's such an enormous evolution of the way you can appear to your marketplace as dental practices. It's changed enormously throughout your career. That's right. And the other thing we're doing is, is we've got clients, uh, some orthodontics, the orthodontists in, in Austin, Texas, um, they were... With COVID, they, they, their waiting rooms became completely empty, but the patients were still coming in for, for treatment with all the right, you know, protection and everything. But they started putting Channel D in all the video, in all the treatment rooms. This is a big practice. And, with, and each treatment room has a screen in a way that the patient can see it. So you've got Channel D playing silently and they were using all the orthodontic type of things that we had. But then they realized a lot of the times they want to do adults as well. And so they're adding other content in there to get the adults to see what's going on. And when the patient's there and you're, you know, a foot away from their face and they see a video 
and they make a comment or smile or make a or any you know ask a question you're in immediate discussion with that patient about what's just on the screen and you control what's on the screen so suddenly now you're into conversations that you wouldn't have had and it's the process of actually initiating conversations that makes an enormous difference in being able to grow a practice and this is something that's completely overlooked by dentists they don't understand that conversations lead to treatment no conversations no treatment the problem is what conversations can you have when you bring it up often the patient's looking at you thinking why are you bringing this up you know whereas if the patient brings it up asking the questions that you want them to ask you that's brilliant and that's what these videos do they trigger conversations that the patient is interested in which creates treatment and if you can understand that little sequence that changes everything and that's what channel d is for it's wonderful so it's less about you pushing yourselves onto the patients and more around creating opportunities around the patient for them to tap into the things that intrigue them absolutely and it is you're right it's a completely different mindset that that patient has in receiving the information they've asked for it there's a big difference between feeling like you're being told a whole bunch of stuff that you may you haven't yet deemed necessary for your own knowledge base as opposed to, I'm intrigued about that, tell me more about that. That's right. And just think about all the different treatments that dentists do now that patients don't know about. I mean, I was just, we're just, we've just created a, a video called Spinocath. Now, I don't think any dentist in Australia knows what Spinocath is, but it's a, it's a type of little squirty device. It's like a little syringe, but actually no needle. And it, it, it passes up through the nose and it goes to the sphenopalatine ganglion. And when you squirt that on, you'll get months of no pain. Okay, so if you've had migraine, if you've got TMD problems, if you've got trigeminal neuro, all these pains disappear with that. Now, who knew that? I didn't. But now we've got a video on it. Um, and that, that's an example, a tiny example, if you want to talk about nit- nitric oxide being produced by the paranasal sinuses that make you sort of smarter, stronger, all this stuff, but it doesn't work if you're, if you're a mouth breather. And the dentist should have a really good understanding that mouth breathing is very unhealthy and you can treat it and you can fix it. This, the, in other words, we're opening up the world of dentistry into things that, are, that the patient doesn't understand, a lot of dentists still don't understand it. The channel D becomes a vehicle to be able to get these messages across without you having to bring up all these topics. Because how, how often is it that the dentist is talking, the patient standing behind the patient, patient looking at the dentist saying, shut up already, we're late, stop talking. And the, you know, the, but this way you've got the, the patient asking the right questions and that's all we're talking about is relevant conversations instead of irrelevant conversations. Magnificent, magnificent. I'm really excited by both Cernic Speak and Channel D. I've been exposed to Channel D quite often in the past and with all of your promotions and speaking to some dentists that have had it in their waiting room and once they get it in their waiting room, they never want to get rid of it (laughs) because it does prompt that discussion. And if you can think about all the many solutions and treatments you can offer as a dental practice to your patients, that's just going to grow because as we've just identified, technology is playing an enormous role in the development of the industry. But you're not, never going to sit down with that patient at any point in time and say, give me an hour, I'm going to go through all of the different things that I offer you. It's just not going to happen. So it needs to come to the patient in a different way. So that's what Channel D is certainly all about as well. So, Michael, there is so much to talk about. I feel like I'd like to get you on on future episodes to continue to pick your brain, so hopefully you'll be open to that. (laughs) But in the meantime, both Cernic Speak and Channel D, how can people, for a start with Cernic Speak, where do people go to get more information? What is the kind of cost they are to expect? How can they apply it to their practice? Well, we're just finishing off the whole Cernic Speak content at this time of screening. (laughs) Um, so uh, we expect it in the next few months to have it out, but depending on when people are watching this, it may be available already. Um, but you can just go to cernicspeak.com. That's S-E-R-N-I-K, speak.com. There's no C in the word, so often people do, you know, they won't confuse it, but S-E-R-N-I-K.com. Um, and, and that'll give you some access to something at the moment, at least to put your name on and say, I'd, I'd like to hear more when it's available. So that's that. Channel D is you go to channeld.com and that's that and that'll enable people to start now 
Channel D is around about $200 a month. Um, they can stop at any time. The first month won't cost them anything, so they can try it for, for nothing. Like a full trial, it's not a trial trial. It's like everything, um, you know, including customization. We just assume anybody who starts is going to stay, so we just give them everything anyway. Um, and they can quit at any time. So there's no real financial, you know, cost here it's, it still falls into the category of petty cash in most practices i would say um cernic speak the cost hasn't been determined yet but our agenda is to make things available to dentists and um at, at a reasonable cost so it used to cost an awful lot of money when people go to physical trainings and stopping work this doesn't require you to close the practice and um so i, I think all in all it would make sense. But, you know, that's my point of view. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'll certainly put all of those links in the show notes for people to have a look at. And when Cernic Speak does officially launch, it'd be great to have you back to speak a bit further about the kind of positive impact it can have on dental teams and the eventual success of the practice. I look forward to it. So thank you very much, Julie, for inviting me to speak. <laughs> Thank you so much for being a guest. I, as I say, I've been looking forward to this moment for a long time. I appreciate it. All the best. Hey, if you enjoyed listening to this episode, you should join the club. The club members receive an online lunch and learn every week where I share insights, systems, and strategies to improve the success of your practice. These lunch and learns could not be easier. They are recording, so you can watch them at a time that suit you. Members also have full access to the library of all of our past topics. The price is just $199 per month, and it is a powerful and effective way to upskill your team. I hope to see you there.